Thanks. Welcome everyone. We're so happy you're with us today. Um, hard to believe it's already June 7th and, and we're here to chat about identity theft and being aware. Um, and we know that folks um, have brought a lot of experience to the, the webinar with them and, and we have built in some great opportunities for folks to share your experiences. Um, if you need closed captioning, you can find that uh, closed captioning button on the bottom of your window. Um, if you don't see that, try uh, looking for the button with the three dots. Um, and so once you find that, you can toggle a closed captioning on or off. So we want to make folks aware of that. Um, my name is Sarah Crimens, and I'm an extension educator with the University of Minnesota Extension um, in Family Resiliency. I'm located out at our Morris Regional Office, and with me today is Sam Roth, and Sam is uh, one of our Family Resiliency Educators, and she's located in Scott and Carver Counties, and uh, she and I are going to be going back and forth with slides, so we, we're happy to be here and, and welcome conversation. Also with us today is Lauren Backus, and Lauren um, is one of our regional um, support staffs, executive office and administrative specialists, and she's providing tech support, webinar producer services today. So if you have any tech issues, um, please feel free to, to call or email Lauren, or you can private chat her um, in the webinar as well. Um, and Lauren's going to be helping us monitor the chat and, and providing some links and, and all of that. So we're so pleased to have Lauren with us today. Identity theft is a huge topic and, and it just seems to um, evolve and morph. And, and as things are discovered, um, those identity thieves are, are pretty clever. They're, they're changing up their game. And, and so today we're going to look at uh, signs of identity theft. We're going to talk about how to protect ourselves from that, um, how to report identity theft. And we're going to touch on scams just real quickly. Um, but that's the direction we're going today. So we had this question or this slide up as folks entered the room. Um, so um, if you haven't had a chance, go ahead and share where you're joining from, share an experience or concern you have had related to identity theft. Um, and we had some folks who shared uh, data was compromised from a financial institution. Um, another person had shared they, they thought they were pretty smart, but but sometimes we're, we're taken by surprise with, with issues and attempts. So go ahead and, and share those in the chat as we go. Um, again, we're, we're pleased to have everyone here. So jumping into it, identity theft um, happens when someone steals your personal information, right? They're, they're stealing your identity and with the intent to commit fraud and so the information that, that they might be trying to grab are your name and address, credit card or bank account numbers, social security numbers, maybe your medical insurance information. All of those things um, are, are pretty hot and valuable for identity theft. And if they are able to, to access this information and take action to commit fraud, um, there can be consequences and, and hardships for folks as well. Uh, these acts can really damage your, your credit status. It can cost you time and money, uh, probably a lot of stress maybe that goes with that as, as you work to resolve the issues. And so definitely this is not a, a fun situation for folks to go through. And so that's why it's um, really smart to look at the prevention side and, and hopefully avoid some issues as we go. Um, so this is a, a nice little infographic from the Federal Trade Commission. I love their play on words. It's a scammy snapshot of 2022. And, and as you can see at the top there, they've got their, their top frauds listed. Um, number one, imposters. So people pretending to be you, using information to, 
to do things. Um, number two, they're doing some online shopping in our names. Um, three, um, prizes, sweepstakes, and lotteries. So they're trying to trick people into taking some action. Um, top fraud number four is related to investments. And then number five um, is businesses and job opportunities. So they're trying to trick us into to, um, engaging in, in that way. Um, 2.4 million fraud reports last year. That is huge. And $8.8 billion were reported lost. And that is just the amount that is reported. And in our conversation earlier, um, I think, Sam, you said that your mom was kind of embarrassed, right? She, she, um, she used to teach this. And, and so I think oftentimes there's some shame if, if people do become a, a victim. And, and so they may not want to share that with, with folks and, and they may not want to report it. So chances are that 8.8 .8 billion on the infographic is really low. Um, I was surprised too, it, they indicated that the number of reports is lower, so that that's down, but the amount lost is up. So each individual then is, is losing more money. Um, huge, right? So, so interesting um, information on the bottom there. It talks about how scammers are contacting people on social media or by phone, and, and those led to big losses. So um, social media is the highest overall reported loss, $1.2 billion lost. And then phone calls, highest per person reported loss. Um, so lots of things happening there. And, and I think in our society too, with the impacts of COVID and, and we're, so we're still coming off that, people may be lonely and, and hungry for, for connections with people, but we need to be, we need to be selective on, on who and how we engage with folks. So scam definition, right? Dishonest scheme, a fraud, um, deceptive scheme or tricks used to cheat us out of something, especially money. Um, so we need to be on our game to, to avoid situations like this. Uh, Lauren's going to pull up a poll for us, and we want you to um, respond to which of these are clues that someone has stolen your information. And so she's going to bring up that, that poll. Are you able to find that poll, Lauren? Yep, it's up. It is up. Oh, it doesn't show for me. Okay. Oh. Good. Well, let me know when, when the majority of folks have responded to that. Yep. And then we can share the results once we get most people there. We're at 20 out of 38. Oh, we're still going up. <laughs> okay. And I'm guessing folks can select more than one option. Is that correct? Um, right now it's single choice. Okay. All right. Let's see, we're at 32 out of 37. Do you want me to end it? Sure, sure. Let's take a look at those okay. results. Can you see the shared results? I cannot. Why don't you summarize those for me? Okay. So withdrawals from your bank account you can't explain is 75%. Mm -hmm. Merchants refuse your payment, 3%. Medical providers bill you for services you didn't use, 9%. And IRS notifies you have income from an employer you don't work for, 13%. Right. Well, all of those answers are correct. And, and so there are lots of clues that might indicate to us that, that there is identity theft happening. Um, and, and so we need to be watchful. We need to be observant. There are some also, also some other clues out there. For example, if you don't get bills or other mails, other mail, right? So you're expecting a bill from a credit card company or someone and it doesn't come. Um, uh, uh, identity thief may have switched the mailing address, right? Um, so if you're missing mail, that might be a clue. 
Um, if debt collectors call you about debts that aren't yours, so meaning someone's accumulating debt in your name, that is a clue. If you find unfamiliar accounts or, or charges on, on your credit report, again, that is a major clue. And so we need to be checking those credit reports. If your health plan rejects your legitimate medical claim because the records show you've reached your benefit limit, um, that could be a clue. Another one is if the IRS notifies you that you have more than one tax return that was filed in your name. Huh, major clue. And then the last one is if you get a notice that your information was compromised by a data breach at a company where you do business or have an account, that's, that's just a, a definite clue that, that something is happening in your situation. All right. So it's important um, to identify uh, if something is going on to figure out what information was lost or exposed. What did they have access to? What personal information is out there? Um, maybe you lost your wallet or you learned an online account was hacked. So depending upon what information was lost, there's some steps that you can take to protect yourself from identity theft. Um, there have been some, some recent data breaches, right, um, and maybe not so recent, but Equifax in July of 2019, that was a huge one. Um, they settled a lawsuit um, stemming, actually in 2019, they settled the lawsuit stemming from its 2017 data breach, which exposed personal information of nearly 150 million people. And in that settlement with the Federal Trade Commission and the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and state attorneys general, Equifax agreed to spend up to 425 million to help people affected by the data breach. And, and if you were affected, you, you um, might've been eligible for those benefits. Um, another one is the Marriott Starwood Hotel and Resort. So back in November of 2018, Marriott International um, announced a data breach which exposed the personal information of anyone who had made a reservation at one of their Starwood hotels or timeshare properties um, on or before September 10th of 2018. Um, and so there's... Um, there's steps that folks can take, but we continue to hear stories of situations such as this where, where folks' information has um, been grabbed, right? Known or unknown um, to us. So now an opportunity for folks to have a conversation in the chat. Where does identity theft occur? You know, we, we uh, looked at that infographic and there were a few ideas on that, but please find the, the chat and share with us, where do you think identity theft typically occurs? So we're gonna wait for responses here. All right, in the home, online, in mail, over the phone, everywhere, Alyssa, yeah, anywhere, everywhere and anywhere, for sure, um, everywhere, great responses, just going to scroll down here, online, 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 yep, so all very appropriate uh, responses, and again, on that infographic, it was social media, phone calls were, were a couple of the biggest ways, but anywhere and everywhere. I'm going to pass on to Sam, and she's going to um, take us through the next several slides. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Mary just put in the chat that she had a check mailed to a nonprofit that somebody took um, from their mailbox, so it's really everywhere that it can happen. Um, and if you these were mentioned, um, but your computer and phone is one of the biggest ways that your information can be taken when 
um, people are looking to borrow your identity for their own uses. Um, so it's important to make sure you're using security software when you're online purchasing things that you're using a secured web page. So it should have the HTTPS. If it only has HTTP, then it's not secure. Um, use encryption programs to protect any of your digital data. Um, treat your personal information like cash. Don't leave it lying around. So, you know, passwords, how many times have we said, make sure your passwords are strong and unique and have them different and use a password manager to be able to do that. That will also help protect you. Um, a lot of people here probably work for the U and we have Duo that is a multi-factor authentication we have to use, but there are private um, multi-factor authentication services you can use as well. And again, back up your files. Don't keep everything online um, to be able to be able to look at things and not have others look at them when you don't want them to. Um, we often, it, it doesn't seem like the U gets as many phishing emails as um, a long time ago. I think of all of our um, security has gotten better and are being able to send them straight to trash or um, but if you have a personal email, you're probably still noticing some phishing emails. Um, so they typically will look like they're a company that you know or trust um, and that the thieves are using these emails to trick us into giving up our passwords or other information. So you want to make sure that you don't take the bait. Um, we love the Federal Trade Commission. I can get lost in looking at their most recent scams um, that they have coming up uh, or that they have going on that people have reported. Um, but it's important to think about like, don't respond to emails that are asking for your personal or financial information. If you don't know who the people are, or if you do know who the person is, and it just seems wrong, you know, call them and or email them not be of um, replying. Um, and also to make sure to that you are reporting, you know, phishing emails and scams, because that'll help decrease them as well. Um, and there's just a few things that like, attachments never open up an attachment from somebody you don't know or from somebody you weren't expecting from and on the slides it just shows a few things that phishing um, people who are using phishing as a technique may be trying to get you to click on um, so that they make you believe it's important um, so that you do click on it um, here's an example of one oops that went a little too far And this one is from Netflix, and I realize it's just a little, and yes, Brianna, we will send a PDF of our PowerPoints with everybody. Um, but this one is just from Netflix as an example of a phishing one. And the biggest thing on this one is that it just says, hi, dear. You know Netflix has a program that's going to automatically put in my name, Sam, if they're sending me an email. They're not just going to put, hi, dear. Like, that is suspicious, number one. Um, they have that button of update account now that is definitely a sign of hoping you to um, we'll click on that to update my payment details. Um, but when you first just look at it super quickly, like the Netflix logo looks correct, it's the right color scheme, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so it's a, important to kind of really look at these and um, notice differences. You'll also notice, if you can see it, is that help center. Center is spelled S-E-N-T-R-E, -E, which is more of a British English thing than a US English thing. So that's also another red flag if I'm in the US and I see a word spelled in um, British English instead of this English. Um, and like I said, with a previous one is that you can report phishing if you do receive it, especially if it's multiple things from the same um, organization or same person that's sending it to you. Um, so if you get an email, you can just do forward it to the anti-phishing working group, or you can send, if you get a text message, you can forward it to spam, which is 7726. Um, and you can also report these to the FTC as well. And that just helps get those people into trouble so that they don't keep phishing. Um, it's also important to create strong passwords. I think we all have heard this. We all know this. We may not all do this. Um, and that having that different password for each account. Um, and the longer the phrase is, the better, but you have to be able to remember it. So something that you can remember, and then, you know, an exclamation point, an asterisk, and then a number is always um, a good thing to be able to use um, of creating those strong passwords is one of your first ways to be able to stop identity theft. 
There are also some special forms of identity theft. There's tax identity theft, child identity theft, and medical identity theft. And we're just going to talk briefly about each of those because they are more well, I guess, done more, maybe not more well known, but done more. Um, and so tax identity theft occurs when someone uses your stolen personal information, and that includes your social security number to file a tax return claiming a fraudulent refund. Um, this happened a lot during the pandemic because people lost jobs permanently or temporarily and were receiving unemployment. Um, and so this one has decreased a little bit um, the last tax season and hopefully will decrease more this tax season, but it's still something to be aware of. Um, and if you are a victim, um, you may you need to identify the IRS if it's fishy to you. So that's tax identity theft. Our next one is child identity theft. And this is more prevalent than people realize. Um, our colleague at um, in South Dakota State University, Dr. Betts Hamilton, um, does research in consumer affairs and recently presented a webinar in May. And you know, one in 50 children were identified theft victims in 2021, an estimated 25%. So that's one in four children before they turn 18 will be um, identity theft victims. And 30% are the perpetrators did steal the identity of a family member. Um, child identity theft is often unreported because parents are the perpetrators and kids or another family member is, and the children don't want to get those adults they know and love and trust into trouble, um, so they do not report. So um, I always, I work with a lot of youth, and I always say, you know, when you turn 18 at the latest, check your credit history so that you know what is on it and hopefully it's nothing because that's what should be on it um, and it's a lot easier to take care of it then versus when you're older and trying to wanting to do a few more things with your identity And then the last one is medical identity theft. Um, and that's just, you have the right to be able to know what's in your medical files. Um, and that includes your doctor, clinic, hospital, pharmacy, laboratory, and health plan. Um, thieves may have used any of that information. So make sure you know what's in your medical records. Um, review them and report any errors to your healthcare providers as well so that they are able to fix those errors. And we're just going to do a quick little video to help um, to help explain it. So, identity theft happens. It's an unfortunate fact of modern life. But there are certain steps you can take to help keep your personal information from falling into the wrong hands. Every day, you do things to protect what's most important to you. And you know what? You do them almost automatically. Routine things like looking both ways before you cross, brushing your teeth, and buckling your seatbelt. Another routine to get into is keeping tabs on your identity and personal information. Here are five easy ways you can do it. Read your credit card and bank statements carefully and often. Know your payment due dates. If a bill doesn't show up when you expect it, look into it. Read the statements from your health insurance plan. Make sure the claims paid match the care you got. Shred any documents with personal and financial information. Review each of your three credit reports at least once a year. It's easy and it's free. And before you know it, protecting your personal information can be as routine as locking your doors at night. For more tips and tools on dealing with identity theft, visit ftc.gov slash ID theft. That's ftc.gov slash ID theft. And I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Thanks, Sam. I did want to, um, someone had a question in the chat about password managers. And I did put a link in the, the chat from the Federal Trade Commission. Sam said, um, shared that's one of our favorite sources. And they provide several of the 
the same recommendations that Sam provided about, you know, making sure your passwords um, long and strong and don't reuse them, the multi-factored piece. But they also address um, considering a password manager and, and because it's hard, right, to keep track of all of those, those passwords that we have. Um, and so they, they suggest considering storing your passwords and security questions in a reputable password manager. And so they suggest searching independent review sites and talking to friends and family for ones that they use and to make sure to use a strong password to secure the information in your password manager. So another password. Um, they, they don't recommend certain sites, but again, just like when we're, we're checking out other things to make sure we have um, word of mouth and, and you know, um, recommendations from folks that that we use. I'm going to pause here for one more question that um, Lauren shared with me, and I'm just going to go ahead and read this. Um, someone stole one of the participants' identity and opened a checking account online at Bank of America. And when they called the bank about the fraudulent account, it um, they sent um, the person an affidavit to complete before they would do anything. Um, with a fraudulent account and and um, the participants a little leery about giving the Bank of America your social security number copy of ID. Um, you do not bank with them at all. Um, should I complete the affidavit and return it or should I report my identity stolen only to the government websites. Good questions. We're going to go ahead and go through the next um, whoops stop that. Let me see if I can, there we go. We're gonna go through the next uh, several slides about reporting identity theft and, and we'll see if there's a, a, a answer to your question here. We'll, we'll come back to it after we go through um, several of these slides. So first step as um, laid out by the FTC is to report the theft, right? And so just like our participant did, they called the company where they knew that the fraud occurred. So that was the right thing to do. Talked with the fraud department, explain that someone stole your, your identity. Um, next part of this would be to ask them to close or, or freeze any accounts. And, and since um, our participant didn't have any accounts there, that, that wouldn't apply. Um, but if, if you do have accounts there, asking them to close or freeze those accounts so that no new charges um, can happen unless you give authorization. And of course, changing those logins, passwords, and pins um, would be really um, important to do. Um, so, so that's the first step. Um, you may also want to um, report to the, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission as well. Um, it is recommended to place a fraud alert or um, review your credit reports at a very minimum. Um, you are able to place a free one-year fraud alert um, on um, the three major credit bureaus. So you contact one of the 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 bureaus, Experian, TransUnion, or Equifax, and then they will contact the other two. So putting that fraud alert on there is really important because that, that raises a red flag anytime someone would be trying to open a new account in your name. Um, or at a very minimum, review those credit reports to see if there's uh, any clues, any suspect accounts that, that would make you um, concerned about that. To request a free credit report um, of the three credit uh, reporting agencies, uh, use annualcreditreport.com. This is the one site that is um, approved um, by the, the federal government. And so with this, you can get a free report from each of the three bureaus, um, not your score, um, but the reports, and that's that's where the details are. You want to, again, make sure that everything in there belongs to you. Here we go. So step three is reporting to the, the Federal Trade Commission. And so um, you can really decide um, if you wanted to do step one or step three first, right, going directly to the company or reporting to the FTC first. And so the, the things that they want to know is what happened, right? Um, 
And so they'll, they'll have questions about your situation. You'll need to provide as much information, as many details as possible. Um, and then based on the information you provide, um, the FTC or identitytheft.gov will create um, your identity theft report um, and help create a recovery plan. Um, and so your identity theft report um, can prove to someone or businesses that someone stole your identity. And it also guarantees certain rights for you. So um, it's probably best not to skip this, this step. Um, if you create an account um, with the FTC, they'll walk you through each recovery step. Um, they'll help update your plan as needed, track your progress, and, and um, they have forms that'll be pre-filled and they, they've got a letter templates and different things that can help you. If you don't create an account, you, you would need to print and save your identity theft report and recovery plan right away. Um, because when you leave the page, then you won't have access to that information um, at that time. So we had you, or it's recommended you contact the company that you know where the, the identity theft happens, you file a report at the Federal Trade Commission, and you may also choose to report to the local police station at this time as well. I think it's really smart to to do that as well, because our, our local police departments track some of that for the community. I was in a large big box store in my small community the other day, um, and I had to return something. And so I was waiting in line at the customer service desk and, and I overheard the transaction that was attempting to happen in front of me. There was a, an older person, um, so older than me, um, was trying to purchase a bunch of gift cards or like prepaid visa cards and the clerk would not sell them to that person because they suspected that um, that the person was being scammed right and, and there's lots of different scenarios where that could happen and the person was really quite upset but the clerk wouldn't sell it to them so that 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 was their way of protecting um, and I, I didn't intervene at all. But when I got up to the desk, then I asked the clerk if they contact the lo local police department about that. And she said, no, they don't. And I really encouraged her to make that contact so that um, the police can monitor that in the community and perhaps do some public education on what kinds of trends are happening there. So, so um, uh, a report to your local police department would be a, a good thing to do. So after all those reports are made, what do you do next? Um, so if there, when you need to repair the damage and, and as indicated, the FTC will help you develop um, a plan um, to, to look at some of those things, which is extremely helpful. And so needing to close some of those accounts, uh, all the accounts, the new accounts that are, are opened in your name. And so you'll need to call the fraud department of each business where an account was opened that you're aware of. Again, go through your story, share what happened, um, ask them to close that account, um, ask the business to send you a letter confirming that the fraudulent account was not yours, um, that you're not liable for it, and and that it was removed for your, from your credit report. So you're asking for those three things in writing from that company. So again, that the fraudulent account wasn't yours, you're not liable for it, and that it was removed from your credit report or not reported there at all. Um, so hopefully they would be agreeable and send that letter and you're gonna wanna hold on to that letter um, and you'll need to use it if that account appears on your credit report later on. Um, notes that the business may require you to send them a copy of your Federal Trade Commission identity theft report or complete um, a special dispute form. Um, and the FTC does have a sample letter that, that can help with that. And so I'm guessing our, our scenario that one of our participants put on uh, in the chat working with Bank of America, they're asking for some of that information. And, and I would ask those questions. Why do you need 
my social security number and a copy of my ID. Um, so ask what, what they're going to do with that and why, but it, it sounds like they're trying to collect some information so that perhaps they can do these three things or include these three things in a, in a letter for you. So the next one is remove uh, bogus charges from your account. So if it's an existing account that you already had, again, you're going to contact the fraud departments of those businesses, tell your story. You'll, you'll be an expert on telling your story by the time you get done. Um, you know, ask that those uh, charges, those fraudulent charges be removed. Um, and then again, ask for a letter confirming um, those similar sorts of things. Um, and then correct your credit reports. So if these things do end up on your credit reports, they, they could have negative um, a negative impact on your credit report if you're wanting to get a loan down the road or or um, our credit report impacts so many things from from loans to perhaps insurance or or maybe getting a job or, or getting housing um, and so you're going to want to work to get that removed and so um, contacting those three credit bureaus Equifax Experian TransUnion again um, send them a letter and I believe the FTC has a a draft letter, a sample letter that that you could um, include in that. Um, and the information that I have does say that um, you would typically need to have proof of your identity, like your name, address, and social security number. So then um, our our case story, case study here, they they may need that to document um, identity. It, again, explain. Um, the information that that you have, ask them to to block that information and take that off your your credit report, and and so um, so very important to to work with that. The next one on our list here is to consider adding an extended fraud alert or credit freeze. Now, extended fraud alert. Um, is where a company um, must contact you before granting new credit in your name. It's free to place that and remove it. Um, it's available if someone has stolen your identity. It can last for up to seven years. And you can set that extended fraud alert by contacting just one of the three national credit bureaus. And then they will contact the other two, which is helpful so you don't have to go tell that story again. Um, and so you can definitely do that. The other piece is that credit freeze, and that limits access to your credit report unless you lift it or remove it. And it's free to place and remove. Um, it's available to anyone, including parents, guardians, conservators can do that for, for kiddos under 16 um, or for adults, vulnerable adults who maybe are under your care. Um, and that one lasts until you lift it or remove it. And, and you, um, with the credit freeze, you need to contact each of the three credit bureaus um, to request that credit freeze. And, and they probably have some special forms that you would need to, to do that. Um, but both the, the fraud alerts and the credit freezes can help prevent further misuse of your personal information, which is extremely helpful. Um, but there are important differences um, as well. So we, we went over just some of those real quickly. Um, and then the last thing again, um, and we've mentioned this before, to review your credit reports often. Um, through December 2023, um, because of, of COVID, you are able to check your credit reports actually weekly for free at annualcreditreport.com. This can help you spot any new frauds um, quickly, um, but be checking those credit reports. Other possible steps that, that you might want to look at, um, if you identify that your social security number has been misused, um, maybe your, your social security card was lost or stolen, um, definitely you're gonna need a replacement card for that. Or if you think that someone got your number through a variety of methods, 
you are going to, um, it'd be good to review your social security work history and see if there's something that's being reported, jobs um, being reported that you haven't had. And so you can um, connect with the local social security administration office near you, or you can definitely go online. Um, I think it's my SSA to um, access that report to see what is, is being reported there. The next item here is to stop debt collectors from trying to collect debts you do not owe. And so um, that, that sounds really like a lot of work to me, but so necessary, right? So it's important to take care of those things. So you'll need to write to those debt collectors within 30 days of getting those collection letters. Um, there's a sample letter that the FTC has. Um, you know, tell your story again, send copies of your ID um, theft report um, and, and all of those details. And so we don't wanna sit on this. You need to act pretty quickly uh, within that 30 days and um, contact the business where the fraudulent account uh, was opened. Um, explain your story again, the debt doesn't belong to me and, and go through those steps um, and be checking your credit reports as well. If your, your wallet or your purse was stolen and you lost government issued IDs, of course, you're going to want to get replacements for those. Um, the social security card, again, you can apply online and get um, a free replacement, I believe, of that. Driver's license, if it's lost or stolen, of course, you're going to have to go to the DMV and report that. Um, so important to do if your passport was lost or stolen, um, you would need to connect with the State Department. And then if you want to replace that, um, you would, would need to take steps. And if you have travel planned pretty quickly, there might be some options for that. And then the last one is, is kind of scary, right? Clearing your name from criminal charges. Um, so if someone is arrested and uses your name or personal information, definitely connect with the law enforcement agency that arrested the thief. Um, you may need to check court records to find out where they were arrested, um, file a report about the impersonation, um, again, you know, provide telling your story, um, providing any documentation that you can and, and all of that. So, so tracking um, that and the Federal Trade Commission has um, a great list of steps um, on how to work through that. So if, if there are certain situations where identity theft um, has occurred, there's things that you can do um, related to utilities. Um, you know, we know living can be expensive and utilities is one of those. And so if someone is wanting to cut their living costs, they may, may try to, um, you know, scam and, and um, impact your utilities. So um, definitely contact those service providers, tell your story again, ask them to close the account. Um, the Public Utility Commission might um, be helpful in, in those situations. And with all of these steps, it's probably a, a really good idea to have a notebook or a tablet. And every time you talk with someone, um, document the date and who you talked with and what was said. And anytime you mail a letter, um, you know, send copies of things, keep the originals. So um, it really requires um, being organized. Um, if there's a, a scam or identity theft happening with, with phones, the National Consumer Tele, Telecom and Utilities Exchange um, is is a, a player in this and and you can request some assistance and um, support there. If the government benefits, that's a huge one, right? So contacting the agency that that you're working through related to your your um, your government benefits. and um, if it's social security, you, you would connect again with the Social Security Administration Office for unemployment insurance. You'd be talking with the Department of Labor. Um, so going to the appropriate agencies, checking accounts, working with your financial institution again, um, 
and and tracking that. Um, there's a, a service or an organization called Check Systems, and they um, they have reports on us, which compiles information about our checking accounts, and so you can contact them and, and get a copy of your report. Um, and again, the FTC has all of those specific contact information, and we will be including the FTC link in our follow-up email as well. Student loans, right? Education is expensive. And so um, again, contact the school or the program that opened the, the loan, tell them your story, ask them to close that loan and, and send you, a, again, documentation that you're not responsible for that. If it's a federal student loan, um, you're gonna be working with the US Department of Education and their Office of Inspector General. Um, and there's phone numbers um, to, that, that will be on the website that can help direct you um, to that. Apartment or housing rentals, again, going to that landlord. Um, who rented um, to the identity thief and, and asking um, for a, a copy of your tenant history report, um, which um, is a compilation, right? Exactly what it says, your history report. And so um, finding out what's listed there. And again, keeping track of who you've contacted. Investment accounts, call your broker or your account manager, describe the situation. And, and um, so basically with all of these, it's going to the people that, that, um, that you need to speak with. The last one as well is kind of scary when you think about it. If someone filed a bankruptcy in your name, right? So then you're gonna deal with the US trustees and um, work through that process as well. So lots of... Um, areas and ways that identity thieves may may impact you. Sam, I'm going to pass it back to you. Yep. So that was all about identity theft. And um, sometimes when we talk about it, there's confusion about what's identity theft, what's a scam. Well, a scam is using that information and doing something. Um, and really, we want to make sure that we're not falling for those tactics that they might come across. Um, so we've all heard of scams. We're going to just highlight a few that aren't always known as well, or maybe new to some people. So the first one is the donation scam, which I'm guessing most people have heard about, but that's just where people are asking for money. And um, if you are on any social media, you will get requests. Facebook now has a link, you know, raise funds for your birthday. I'm not saying that's a scam, but there is a percentage that's going to Facebook that's not going to that charity of choice. Um, so whenever you are getting ready to donate something, don't feel compelled that you have to do it as because somebody's asking you on the street corner or you got an email requesting funds. Make sure you do some research about the organization. Um, consider how you pay. Real charities won't ask you to pay by cash, money transfer, gift card, or Bitcoin. Um, that's how scammers ask you to pay. So if you, someone tells you to donate that way, think about donating elsewhere. Um, research crowdfunding too. Many funds will do give real help after tragedies, but often they will be a scammer and it's sometimes hard to spot the difference. Um, so if you want your money to help, do some checking online to make sure that you're going to the official funding spot for that person or that cause that you do want to support. Um, and if somebody is rushing you to donate, just take your time and slow down or that you want to think about it. Um, they Scammers want to get your money as soon as they can and they might start calling, um, pressuring you to give or even saying that you made a pledge and my dad had had this happen to him. He made a pledge last year when they called and he didn't complete his pledge and my dad couldn't remember saying yes to that. Um, and he was like, well, I guess. And thankfully I was at home visiting my parents. And I was like, dad, no, just hang up. Like we can go online and do this safely and know it's going to the cause. We don't know who this person is calling you. Um, so make sure you just take that pause. And sometimes you feel horrible, like, oh, there's this cute puppy and he's in need. I've never, you know, they're on a street corner. They said they're going to get a surgery for them, but it doesn't mean that there's actually anything happening with that said puppy. It could be their owners just trying to 
get that money. So that's, you know, donations, not saying don't donate, but do your research. Um, a person in need scams, I think most people have heard about these or know somebody who's been affected them. Um, but typically they will pose as a grandchild is most common or a relative or a friend. And they'll claim to be ill or that they're stranded in another state or a foreign country or else they are in some other trouble and they'll ask you to send money. And oftentimes they'll ask you to send cash by mail or by gift cards, which is also a red flag. Um, they often beg you to keep it a secret and ask, act fast so you don't get into more trouble or you can get out of your situation. Um, this is where if you do have grandchildren and somebody says your grandchild, that they're your grandchild, call their parent, ask them where they are at, call that child directly, um, have them give you a number to call back to see what you can do to, if you need that time to be able to do that. Um, typically, they won't give you a number. They'll say that they'll call you back, which is also a red flag. Um, but just make sure that like you're checking the caller's story before you help them out um, because this is one that older adults typically fall for because they do want to help out their grandchild or their niece or their nephew or neighbor Tim's son that you know would mow their lawn when he was a boy scout um, all those different ways people are part of it Sarah can you forward the slide for me Um, our next ones are romance scams. Um, and these were new to a lot of people um, when we presented this two, three times ago. Um, can you go to the romance scams one, Sarah? Um, and so um, it is Pride Month. And so it's horrible to say this, but often the LGBTQ plus dating apps are targets for romance scams. Um, and this is typically um, just because it's a vulnerable population um, or can be a vulnerable population. Um, and they're really just mainly extortion scams. Um, it's one of those, you know, I love you, please send money. I can't wait to visit you, but I'm sure could you send money for a plane ticket? Um, I'd love to see you, but first I have to pay this person back. I need to work more. And so they might start with asking for $5 or $10. And then pretty soon they're asking for 500 and a thousand. And it's really just a form of extortion. Um, so if that is what's happening to you, um, you know, take that pause again, really ask some questions about that person. Um, oftentimes these people in romance scams will threaten that, you know, you don't trust them um, or that they'll let, if you aren't out, this is why LGBTQ is often targeted. If you're not out yet, they'll let your parents know or tell somebody else you're close to. Um, so it's almost that blackmail aspect of that. Um, and typically for people who are taken uh, for romance scams, their median dollar loss is $2,500, which is quite a substantial amount of money while looking for love. Um, so just be aware of that too. And you don't have to be LGBTQ to have this happen to you, um, but that is who the population is targeted as well. Okay. So our next one are disaster recovery scams. And we live in Minnesota and we can have tornadoes, we can have floods, we can have a windstorm, um, maybe not an earthquake, um, but you know those natural disasters do hit us here in the state or if you're other places. Um, so just be aware that this is a very vulnerable time if it has happened to you or somebody you know, um, because you're overwhelmed that maybe you lost a portion of your house um, and people will prey on that. So be very skeptical, skeptical of anyone promising to be able to do cleanup. Um, you know, take a moment because they'll quote some outrageous prices and you don't know. So take time to do that research. Like, what is this going to cause? Um, check that person out, ask for IDs, licenses, proof of insurances, all that kind of stuff. Make sure to guard your personal information if something does happen and you do have people coming in to help clean out your home or to do, you know, if you had a flood and you need all your flooring um, to be done, hide that information, lock it up, make sure you have it so that there, it's not just out for somebody else to be seen as you're working through paperwork, that kind of stuff. Um, also, it's important to know that FEMA doesn't charge application fees. So if somebody says they can help you get money for FEMA, um, if you pay them 20 bucks, 
don't do it. Um, so that's another thing to think about. The next one are some chain letter scams. Um, if you are my age, you had chain letters that you probably did when you were in elementary school. They have moved online and it is often called the circle game or blessing loom or jumping on a money board. Um, and that's often when people are saying um, that it's kind of a pyramid scheme. So mainly you're going to have promises that if you collect $800 for an investment of $100 at the same time, you'll bring good fortune to the next person who's recruiting. Um, so you could see a post on Instagram, Facebook, or other social media. And so you just send $100 through PayPal or someplace else. And then your name is at that center of the board. And then the next person comes in and they get a spot and they get a spot. And as more people come in, you get a percentage um, of how that works. Um, so if you get an offer to join, you know, if it's too good to be true, which this one is, don't do it. It is a scam and you're never probably going to end up with that money as well. Um, the next one is furry friends. If you are an animal lover or, you know, just think they're cute, um, people are going to use that against you. So um, when you're looking for pets, make sure you're doing your research on what you um, are looking for, who is the animal shelter are they reputable um, or is the if you buy from somebody who this is their business make sure they're also reputable um, when I said I went down the rabbit hole of looking at FTC there was a lot of animal scams of saying we have this specific puppy for sale you can have it wire us $800 it's yours oh we'll ship it to you Oh, because of shipping, we need an additional $1,300. So now we're in for a dog for $2,100, if I did my math correctly. Um, don't judge me if I didn't. Um, so, and then, you know, there's another issue with the shipping. Your dog will arrive at this time. You go to show up. You spent all this money. You go to show up. The dog's not there. It never was going to be there. The person, you know, was based in another country. Um, so make sure to do your research, you know, physically see the animal if you can or have a reputable company, you know, one of those things, again, ask other friends and family where they've gotten their dogs from. If you have a particular breed you're um, interested in, um, make sure to search online for the animal's image. It's not that hard to find a super cute photo of a dog and a cat. Um, and then don't pay with a gift card or wire any money to a person if they're going to, um, if you're going to get an animal. Um, so basically trust your gut tell somebody, um, tell the FTC when you spot a scam. Um, I like to go on every now and then at the FTC website, just put in Minnesota and see what scams are going around um, to help people realize that. You can report to the Better Business Bureau as well as the state attorney general here in Minnesota. Um, the next slide shows where you can go if you're not in Minnesota. Again, review your annual credit report. Um, I think we've said that a few times, so we both strongly encourage people to know what's on your credit report. That is what affects your score. So knowing your score doesn't really tell you a whole lot, doesn't give you the history behind it. Um, and you can also register your phone number on the National Do Not Call um, registry is to help hopefully prevent some, um, but that's without reporting you, um, those numbers can't get blocked. So if you do get a scam, do call. Um, if you want to see if you're any good, there is a game. We'll put that in the email. It's kind of fun to play to whether or not you can avoid the scammers. I've yet to pass with 100%. Um, I usually get about 70%, even though I've done it multiple times. So um, if you have any questions, put them into the chat. Sarah is just going to go through a few final details as we as you're putting questions in. Thanks, Sam. And, and Sam and I'll hang out here for a little bit after, after we're done, but we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, Lauren is going to put the evaluation link in the chat. Um, so please complete that if you want a certificate of participation. There's a question at the end there. If you are searching out those um, coveted U of M well-being points, there's also information there. This um, webinar is part of the Making Sense of It All series, so that might be one of the questions that you have there. Um, we are in the midst of our May through August webinars. We have nine series with 31 webinars, so we're one month into that. You can see the list of, of series that we have, so there's a URL and a, a QR code, and we'll include those in our follow-up email as well. We encourage you to um, check out the variety of 
of topics that are happening. And as always, if we invite folks to, to engage with us on social media, these as well will be on the follow-up email. So thank you, Lauren, for putting that evaluation link in the chat. We will also, as I indicated, um, be sharing um, information, the, the links in the follow-up email. Um, thanks, Kelly, for, for the kind words. And we'll hang out here for just a little bit if anyone has any questions.